Uh, my story is that um, I was actually right down here. I was drinking $2 beer night at the Griffins game. And the Grand Rapids Griffin came over, took a lady's purse, was acting like he was going through it, triggered me into wanting to fight the Grand Rapids Griffin. And my wife said, sit down, what are you doing? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> so we leave the game, I'm really, really drunk, and uh, just everything kind of came right down in on me, everything all at one time. And my idea was I'm gonna jump out of that car at 80 miles an hour. Not a great story, Great story is my wife's 125 pounds of pure muscle and said, you sit down in this car right now, we're going to talk about it. And so we did. And a lot of what Jeff hit on, the, uh, you know, the hopelessness, that I didn't feel what I was doing was good enough anymore. And I came, so when I was in the military, I was the corpsman for Top Gun. So I got to deal with the best of the best all day long at the top level. I was also an aerospace physiological technician in the Navy. So coming from all that, I came back into the civilian world, didn't know what I was doing anymore. <laughs> and, you know, literally it's, it's right in line with what Jeff is saying. Um, luckily, I had a really good uh, support system with my wife, my wife's family, my family. Um, jumped around from job to job after that, ended up working for the VA for a little while, and then uh, interviewed for this position as a veteran navigator. And the veteran navigator position is really neat. Um, you know, I got, there's quite a few of them here right now, uh, throughout the state, there's 10 regional and I think seven, uh, county navigators. And what we do is we help, uh, veterans that have substance abuse disorder or, uh, mental health issues. And we help navigate them through either the VA system or the community system. Um, so again, kind of along the line with what Jeff was saying, um, and how we go forward with that. So some of the objectives I want to talk about with, uh, with suicide prevention are I just want to bring some awareness, uh, some myths about it and some realities to it, some data on suicide, some warning signs, how to help, and uh, a little bit of a resource guide. Uh, so some awareness is that uh, suicide is actually the top leading cause of psychiatric emergencies. Um, in the ER, uh, there's the C's. For every suicide death, there are five hospitaliz hospitalizations and 22 emergency room visits for suicidal behaviors, uh, which is over 670,000 visits per year. It's a very large number. Uh, males are four times more likely to die by suicide than females. Every 17 minutes, an American dies by suicide. And suicide is the eighth leading cause of death in America. So some of the myths, uh, a myth is asking about suicide may lead a veteran to take his or her life. That is not true. Asking about suicide does not create suicidal thoughts. The act of asking the question simply gives the veteran permission to talk about their thoughts or feelings. Again, in line with Jeff, he said, you know, I got to ask this person, are you going to harm yourself? You know, do you feel like harming other people? And that gives them that outlet to talk. And uh, one thing you'll notice about veterans, um, once I say to another veteran, I'm a veteran myself, opens up the floodgates. Doors, doors open, we start talking. Um, another myth is there are talkers and there are doers. Um, that's not always true. Most people who die by suicide have communicated in some intent. They've reached out in some way, started doing certain things, giving belongings away, um, they just don't, you know, it's just erratic behavior that you're not normally seeing from that person. Another one is if somebody really wants to die by suicide, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, that is definitely not true. Uh, most suicidal ideas are associated with treatable disorders. Um, helping someone can connect with treatment can save their lives. And uh, that's really a big part of what the veteran navigators can do is, you know, there is the suicide hotlines. Um, with the veteran navigators being contacted, we can actually start stepping in, helping, getting them connected to the right resources. One of the last ones is he or she really wouldn't die by suicide because he just made plans for vacation. She has a young child at home, uh, made a verbal or written promise. She knows how dearly her family loves her. Unfortunately, the intent to die can override any rational thinking. 
Um, I really did like what Jeff said the last one. I didn't, I never heard it before this today, but you know, sometimes there's that pause point right there in the middle. And a lot of times veterans will run right through that, and get the mission done. Here's some, uh, some data that, uh, we, that he was talking about as well. It just happens to coincide with exactly what I was gonna talk about. Um, and this is the per 100,000. Per 100, and uh, so if you see here, here's your total. And this is for Michigan suicide. And then here's the veteran suicide rate. So per 100,000 people, 35.5 veterans in Michigan commit suicide. Um, what's kind of sad about that, and if you think about this, is Michigan is one of the top friendliest state for veterans in, in the United States. I think Texas is maybe considered number one, um, but Michigan's number two, I believe. Um, and again, in line with all the doctor's number, notice I'm the only do doctor up here. So <laughs> all the other doctors and stuff talked about their age groups and how high, you know, above 50. So this, these data, this data just supports all of that. Um, and then this is kind of another interesting thing down here on the bottom uh, is this, this is how most uh, suicides happen. And a lot of times uh, what is happening is, is that it's uh, through firearms, um, suffocation, poisoning, and other. Um, and I'm pretty sure the, uh, it speaks for itself. So some risk factors for suicide. Kind of heard this all day long. Mental health disorders, social isolation, homelessness, impulsivity, uh, incarceration, low self-esteem, shame. Some big, some big factors that can really uh, kick in for people. So this is a big one, warning signs and symptoms. Uh, knowing the warning signs is actually the biggest part of what you can do to help. So if you can see these signs and symptoms and understand that, hey, maybe I should ask that question. Are you gonna, can I help you? Are you gonna commit suicide? Do you have the ideas? Do you have a plan? And uh, so knowing those warning signs, um, aggressive behavior, increased alcohol and drug use, go back to my story. I put away 25 beers that night. Not saying, you know, that's a, a record or a goal or anything, but you know, I did. Dramatic mood swings, same thing that happened to me. Um, impulse, reckless behavior. Any person exhibiting these behaviors should get care immediately. My care happened to be my family. Uh, looking back, I really wish that they would have brought me somewhere. Get me more help, you know, some professional help. Um, I got through it, I got lucky. But uh, in... in in the most scenarios, you want to get that veteran to help. Um, one of these, you know, you see this here, putting their affairs in order, saying goodbye to family and friends. Um, that story of that Marine really hits home. Um, I, uh, in my Navy unit, we're all Navy corpsmen, and I had a, a corpsman commit suicide at the end of a drill weekend, one weekend. We didn't see the signs and symptoms. He... Got really bad news at drill, uh, was go struggling at school, and on the way home, uh, he drove his brand new uh, Jeep into a tree. And he survived and went to the hospital. In the hospital, he says, I'm fine, I'm fine. They gave him a bunch of pain medicines for the pain. He went home, waited for everyone to leave the house, took all the pain medicines and hung himself. Um, this really affected our unit really hard because we're a medical unit, right? We should have seen those signs and symptoms, but we didn't. It was kind of, it was hard to, to see them and they happened very quickly with this, this individual. Um, but even in the professional setting of the hospital, they didn't catch it either. They just thought it was, oh, it was a car accident. And then he ended up committing suicide, which then... Now my unit is, we do training every year. We're very much um, a part of the rest of the, not the rest of the Navy Reserves and just wanting to really, really be a part of it and saying like, hey, if, you know, you wanna talk about that? Let's make sure we're, you know, very, very,
proactive with it. Um, some more signs and symptoms. Um, again, see that giving away uh, prize positions. He didn't give his Jeep away, but he did run it right into a tree. Um, one of the big things that we were looking at when, when, when you know, retrospectively, we look back at his, his particular scenario. He was depressed. He had anxiety because he just got some bad news in the reserves. He had uh, loss of interest at school. He was irritable. Uh, he was humiliated because he wasn't making rank like everybody else. Uh, just there was a lot of things that were right there that was just signs and symptoms that we didn't recognize. So this is one of the biggest slides that I really like, I'd like to focus on. And this is how to help someone considering suicide. Um, know the risk factors, which we just talked about. Talk openly with your loved ones and your friends. Um, a big one, the biggest support factor that you'll have is probably your family. Uh, whether it's on a phone, whether it's with you, um, you know, your mom, dad, brother, sister, uh, and one that I'd like to throw in is your other military family. Um, for those who have served, you understand what I'm talking about with that. Um, I call my, my fellow sailors all the time and say, hey, how are you guys doing? You know, I'm just going through a rough time right now. And they talk me through it, and it's no big deal. Um, obtaining professional help is good. Uh, do not argue with the person is a big one. Um, and the number one thing that I've found is do not leave the person alone. So here's another story I have. I was in Fallon, Nevada, middle of nowhere, which is where uh, Top Gun is located. And had a guy come in and he's standing there talking to me and he's avoiding the conversation. He came into medical to talk to me and I'm trying to get information out of him, but he won't give me anything. And I'm kind of like, what's going on here? And he's just kind of avoiding me. And I finally asked him, I said, are you thinking about committing suicide? And he said, yes. Well, that was the longest three days of my life. We had to call the military police and I had to fly with this guy and those two military police members from Fallon, Nevada to San Diego, California until we got this guy into the treatment that he needed. This gentleman went through the treatment, came back to Fallon, Nevada, came in, gave me a big old hug, said, thank you very much. You saved my life. It's, it's why you do what you do. You know, I, I love being a corpsman. I don't like all the blood and gore, everything, but it's part of the job. But saving lives is just, it makes me happy. So just do never, never leave someone alone when they say that they're feeling suicidal. Um, so this one here is if you're not with the person, you know, um, you can try and convince them, call their doctor, chaplain, pastor, uh, the veteran crisis line. Um, if you can escort them to the closest emergency room or call 911. And one of the reasons you might want to call 911 is because they get into an actual ambulance that's transporting them. If something happened and they were trying to commit suicide, they're the best equipped to, um, to, to fix that problem. I learned that one through a heart attack. A <laughs> lady had a heart attack on me and I'm like, oh, hey, we should probably get an ambulance. So, um, but <laughs> some of the resources that, uh, that we have in, the, in West Michigan here or in Michigan in general, um, Veteran Crisis Line, um, you can send a text, you can go online, you can call, uh, you can go right through it. There's 211, community health facilities, uh, your, your local vet center, buddy to buddy, the veteran navigators. Um, if you guys ever have any questions about any, how to take care of a veteran, you know, even if they're not a, a honorably discharged veteran and they, they're other than honorable, anything like that, we don't care. They're a veteran. We're going to take care of them. Um, really, the big thing is just making sure that if you feel that you see those signs and symptoms, you can do it. You can help them. And to be honest with you, it doesn't take somebody who's 
got a doctorate or an MBA or whatever. It literally can be anybody. So I think that's, uh, that's about all I've got there. Why what? Why would you want to prevent a suicide? Is that something? Why would you want to prevent a suicide? Yeah. Well, because a lot of times a suicide in that moment, they feel that that's it. That that's their only option. But many times, if if you prevent that suicide, there's a really good chance that they'll never do it, try and do it again. So you could not just save their life that moment, but you could save their life for the rest of their life. Is that a good enough answer for you, or would you like more? It Why stop it? Why not? Yeah, I mean, if someone's going to do it, and they're dead on set, and they, for whatever reason, that's the path they're going down, even though you can try your hardest as the family is generally the, 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 the connecting point with that person, it, it will happen. But if a lot of times suicides can happen in a blink of an eye where that person, for whatever reason, had the thought, this is, today I'm going to do it, and they just go out and do it. Or they go out into the middle of the forest and then they do it. Whereas if someone were to make that connecting point with that person and get them to start thinking of, why not not doing it, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that could really change a long, long, uh, you know, uh, change that person's life for a very long time. I might have another answer for you. In the, when you're in the moment of irrationality and you see those challenges as like those are your challenges in life, what, what really stinks is it's really just a matter of resources so if we have the right resources going to the right people at the right times and they overcome those challenges, they won't have that feeling of irrationality. So that's really the focus. Why would be to make sure that this person had the fullest potential of having a good life prior to making that kind of a commitment. Does that make sense? You want to you wanna make sure that whatever that person's challenged with, like if they're specifically a divorce or substance abuse, or a very serious traumatic situation that happened to them, there might be some, if there's even a light at the end of the tunnel, a possibility for that individual, you, we want to be there to help them and see if that potential's there before we see that person commit suicide. That's really the why, if that makes sense. Just, just like I would try and do CPR on somebody, if I came up and I saw somebody that was unconscious and not breathing, and I'm going to try doing CPR, I'm going to try and stop them from committing suicide as well. So... We got one more. Yeah, I have another answer to that, and that is that suicide is the most selfish act that any person can do in the world. You have a whole family, you have a whole society, you have a whole community that is dependent upon you being rational. Suicide is very, very selfish. Yes, thank you. I was not in that mode at that time. Now, when I did mine, it was an instant react. I walked by my gun cabinet, and that's all it took was for me to walk by that gun cabinet at that point. Before that, I understood the same way you did as far as how suicide was, because that's how I was brought up. And in most cases, that's how we were all brought up. And it, no, it's not fair to the family but what the person was struggling with, which may help this person over here, um, is tremendous. I had a ton of things that came down on top of me, and I didn't know what to do. And the only thought was, when I was walking out of that situation was, that's it, I can't do no more. And that's the why not.
I don't really have a question. I've got some answers. You're asking why we should do that because he's a living, breathing human being. And he's fallen under some kind of a duress that he doesn't think that he can get out of. Maybe, perhaps he doesn't think that he's loved or whatever. But he's also part of a family, and he's part of a military family in our case. You know, I mean, his life is like a mosaic. If you were to come into a room and you saw a mosaic and one of the pieces were gone, that's that person. It would be incomplete. So we use that. Being, being a chaplain, every person has a soul, and every soul is important. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, next we're going to have our panel up. Dr. Beekner, uh, Dr. Troiani, Eric, Jeff Bird, Derek Van Ballen. Um, Derek, he is the uh, um, Battle Creek VA, or actually works out of the Wyoming VA clinic uh, as the suicide prevention coordinator. Um, I would like to have him kind of talk a little bit about what he does over at, uh, at the VA. No, no, no. You did a good job. I'm moderating. I work better on my feet. Do you want to switch? No. Let's see, great. I'd like to start with having Derek Van Ba to um, talk a little bit about what he does in his position. Is Mike Song here? Is that, yeah, that should be. Okay, can you guys all hear me okay? Okay, my name is Derek Van Ba. I'm the Suicide Prevention Coordinator at the Wyoming VA. Um, my job is not to prevent suicides. That's, that's the joke I get. My job is to help veterans, help providers and reach out in the community and work collaboratively to help address this problem. Um, we have uh, a very small part of the veteran population that utilizes the VA, but a very high number of that population actually attempts and commits suicide. So part of what I do is I manage a few different programs. Um, we have veterans who we identify that have attempted to take their lives. We flag them as a high risk. So I have to follow them and we give them what's called an enhanced treatment or enhanced care where they're seen by their providers a little bit more often um, than a, uh, a veteran who's going for standard care. We also have a program that's new, uh, new as a couple of months ago, it's called ReachVet. And when you go in for your primary care appointments or your mental health appointments, they ask you the depression questions, the, the alcohol related questions, and those answers formulate to a response that if you respond a little bit higher, we try to reach out to you before it becomes a systematic problem. So <clears throat> that's one of the things, you know, I, I've been listening today and the VA is not getting an awesome reputation and some of it's earned and that's okay. But some of the things that we do are on the cutting edge and I think this Reach Vet program is one of those things where we're identifying potential veterans with issues before it becomes an issue and we try to offer them either a social work help if they have you know, employment or housing issues, mental health treatment, things of those nature to prevent it before it becomes something, something significant. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Um, please feel free to come up and if you, if you have a question, I'm gonna start with one. Um, why have, given some of the interpersonal theories of suicide and so forth, um, why have suicides in the military increased so greatly since 9-11? And I'll just open it up to the whole panel. Um, Jeff, you may have a, you seem to be the expert in the <laughs> interpersonal theory, but yeah. why? I mean, most of the, the variables you talked about were the same in Vietnam or World War II. Why all of a sudden? 
this huge spike? <clears throat> Some of it, um, you know, there's theory we don't know. Some of it, a lot of it's theory. Um, it's just a, some of it is, again, interpersonal. It's that, that we're talking about a generation of disconnected folks who, are, who communicate with their thumbs and through social media and don't talk uh, like they used to in previous generations. Um, there's some thought that um, that has an aspect to it. There's some thought that because of these rapid training, you know, before there was, like we talked about in Vietnam, one deployment, now there's splitting of units and people are going with different units and multiple deployments with different units and there's no cohesion with the uh, particular unit in some cases, um, so they lose that belongingness piece. Um, there's, I mean, the, the theories abound as to why they, some people just think it's a generational shift that, you know, in their upbringing versus the way they were brought up, you know, Vietnam, Korea, World War II. I can tell you from uh, from my, I did a year of uh, my clinical time at nurse practitioner school at the VA here uh, when it was up on Coit. And uh, there's a huge difference in talking to a World War II veteran or a Korean veteran versus uh, talking to a, that even a Desert Storm, my generation, or, uh, you know, the post 9 11 uh, veteran. Um, when you talk to a, um, like a World War II veteran, it was, I mean, almost, I would sit in awe almost because um, they would often say, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want this, or I, you know, I just, all I want is, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then the closer that got down to the line, it, you know, you get these younger generation people that would almost come in and demand, I need this, and I want that, and I want, and I want, and you owe me this, and you owe me that, and, um, but whether or not that played into it, but just anecdotally, huge difference between looking at and talking to World War II Korean, I mean, just in their interpersonal, how they, how they think and how they interact with people, completely different mindset between a World War II veteran and a younger veteran. Interesting. Any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I was going to share. One of the things that we've started looking at in our training is educating clinicians on intergenerational differences in veterans, because there are distinct differences in the different generations of veterans. Um, the second thing that we're looking at is also, now President Bush said this is a different kind of war. It is. It's uh, high intensity guerrilla warfare. Um, high intensity engagement with the civilian population, and at the same time, an enemy you cannot identify. You don't know. And as I mentioned in my presentation, it could be that pregnant woman with the three children walking towards you, or that elderly gentleman uh, in the distance uh, who's ready to detonate an IED. Um, and, and that's really confusing, you know, versus a very clear cut. This is uh, North Vietnamese regulars, these are VC, or in Korea, these are North Koreans, these are Chinese, and of course, World War II. Uh, and, and that's where it gets really confusing. Also, the confusion um, that's unsettling is understanding, okay, now what are we fighting for and who are we fighting? Uh, remember, 9-11 was 17 years ago, or is it 18? Yeah, or 17, 17 years, 17 years ago. ago. 17 yeah. years ago. Uh, uh, we've got students going in, we've got people going into the military who don't remember 9-11. Mm -hmm. They don't remember the, uh, that particular day. So uh, uh, it causes kind of that cognitive dissonance. Now, I, I'm going to Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and why did we get there in the first place? And the whole moral question, you know, we trust our leaders to make the legitimate moral decisions, mm -hmm. and yet we've got to live with them, or our soldiers do. One aspect yeah. of that Mark. question I'd like to address, it, it, it uh, touches on something that uh, Dr. Billings pointed out in his book. Uh, so we can ask ourselves, what are the causes? And this is a very complex issue, so there, there, uh, you can look at contextual factors, and you can look at individual or personal factors, but there also are factors of what is not the cause, and one of the point, things that he pointed out was if you look at POWs, uh, mm -hmm. the suicide rate among POWs 
virtually zero. zero. And so if you're looking at being the cause being stress or the cause being uncertainty or ambiguity, uh, that's, that's not going to uh, play out. So you have to look for something else uh, that's going on there. In this case, uh, I would say that it's probably, uh, with, with the case of POWs, you're in a pretty uh, clearly defined relationship. It's not a good one. Uh, but if you look at the soldier's code, your job is to stay alive and resist. So you've got a purpose and you've got a reason. Uh, the, when people uh, talk about suicidality, they're looking at not having a reason or purpose any longer. So it's, it's a contextual factor. So just something to think about there. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. Um, so can someone speak to the increase of psychotropic medication being prescribed and how it's increased 700 percent since 2001? And how that correlates with the increase in suicide. Now, and that's seven hundred percent in the military, or in the military, in the military, in okay. the VA. So, great question. Whose responsibility is that? Is that the veteran who's taking the medication, who's prescribed to him, with the understanding that, hey, I trust my provider; they do not have an intent to harm, or is it the provider's responsibility, who's prescribing uh, dozens? sometimes of different types of medications with different black box warnings that say this medication can lead to suicide. Uh, I'll start off. Uh, this trend parallels what's going on in the not veterans world. Uh, today, most psychotropic medication, I think the last, last figure I heard was 82, 83 percent of all psychotropic medication is not even prescribed by psychiatrists. They're prescribed by uh, GPs, uh, family practitioners, and primary care. So that's become a problem because you've got people not trained who are basically prescribing to symptoms. Uh, the second part of it, why do we have an opiate drug uh, problem in this country? The, the drug companies, do you know at one point Oxycontin was sold uh, as a drug that's not addictive and um, more effective? And that's why we now have an opiate problem. Well, um, and traditionally, I mean, this is, we think we would learn, I think heroin was developed as an um, antidote for morphine. Yeah, heroin was called heroin because it was a cure drug, but then we have the cure drug for heroin addiction called methadone, but the, no. which is even more addictive. Yeah. Than heroin, yes. Yeah. So, um, and, and as a neuropsychologist, I can tell you that Prescribing these medications is very difficult. The brain is, is very complex and the kinds of chemical reactions going on, so you need to monitor it very, very closely um, and watch not only to see whether it's working, but about the psychological and physical effects. And my understanding, although I haven't studied it greatly, is it's the psychiatrists in the military, oftentimes, you, they're just not in a position to every two weeks at first to look and see, you know, and check in, particularly if they're being prescribed on the battlefield. Yeah. Gentleman down here had a question a minute ago. Yeah, I'm there. sorry, who? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> run, run. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, is there any statistics about internationally our suicide rate in this country versus other countries that have an active military that are deployed? There are a number in France, the people deployed in Africa and other countries. What, uh, what is the suicide uh, rate and statistics for other countries and how are they managing this? Yeah, I, I could address it. Um, for example, when uh, we went in on peacekeeping missions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we had our combat stress teams deployed to deal with the high rate of suicides. And while we were there, when I say we, the military, uh, they saw the same parallel rates. And um, uh, our people were training other NATO forces in how to address this because they were experiencing now, the last piece I read is uh, we do see parallel suicide rates among NATO forces. I think the only exception was uh, with the Polish Army. 
because uh, the Polish army was deployed in Afghanistan. But with some of the other services, they were definitely seeing uh, parallel rates. And then another question right down here. Uh, many women in the armed services have had to endure sexual abuse. And I'm wondering, is there a difference or substantial difference in the suicide rate between male and female uh, veterans? There, there uh, we talked about it a little bit in my presentation, but um, the male suicide rate for veterans and in society in general is much higher. The suicidal ideation rate is higher for females um, in both, both cohorts. Um, <clears throat> the rate for um, female veterans taking their own life is about double that of the female version of the civilian sector. Um, they don't do it as often as male veterans, but they're, they do it much more than their, their civilian counterparts. Um, we don't have, we don't know. We look at studies and, and that's part of, you know, when you go and you're trying to find, there's got to be a clue in here. You know, you're Sherlock Holmes in it looking through all this literature. There's got to be a clue as to why. And we haven't found any, anything that, def, that really is that piece that tells us why, uh, A, why males do it more often. Maybe we're just a dumber breed or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, why we do it more or why females have a higher rate, rate of thinking about it but a lesser rate of actually uh, following through. Um, I have my own theories on that. But... Uh, my wife would smack me if I told you those things. Um, just, to, <laughs> I'll throw in something, just a, a thought. Um, really based on what you've all been talking about, my observation, I think there's some good research, is that women by and large are much better than we are at building a network, a social network, and then being able to talk about their feelings. So I wonder whether, and this is, I remember, Herm talking to me about this in the military. The, the women in the military seem to have a much better network than the men. If he, wanted to, if he wanted to get the word out, you know, across the country, he talked to um, his female soldiers and boom, it was across the country. So I wonder whether the women are just have better networks and use them more effectively, this interpersonal piece. I'd like to add just one thing to that. I think some of it is the means in which they attempt with. You know, males are more likely to attempt with more lethal type of means, ergo they'll have a higher success rate uh, than females. So I think that plays a role in why they may have more ideation and attempt, but the completion rates are lower across the board. My question is, I mean, we're talking about the increased rate and all this kind of stuff. My question is the data. I mean, one of you even mentioned that the VA data only didn't even include half the country. So how accurate is the data? And are we now seeing this increase because we have better access to the data than back in the 40s and 50s? We have that access now. So we're starting to track it. We're starting to pay attention to it. It's become a very public issue. So is that part of why we're seeing an increase along with all these other actual factors? I certainly could be a piece. When you look at uh, studies and you look at just society as, as a whole, um, years ago, suicide was very stigmatized. Um, and so even if somebody committed a lethal action, uh, their family may do everything they can to cover that up and make it look or not report it as such. Um, also, in certain particular face, if you commit suicide, uh, you can't be buried in that faith cemetery. And so it, it behooved the, that family not to have it listed as a suicide because it would affect the way that that person could be buried in a cemetery. The Catholic faith is, is one of those, um, my faith. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and then what you speak to, it with, which is the, this increased surveillance, this, you know, we kind of looked at it and said, hey, we got a problem, we gotta, we got to ramp this up. And that's only been in the last few years that, We've tried to fix these surveillance programs because before that, 
we were only looking at a very small number of, uh, of suicides for the VA study. Um, and then there's also, I, I talked a little bit about just the difficulty in, in knowing whether it is or isn't uh, because, you know, some, you might just think this person just OD'd on, on drugs, right? But it may have been a suicide. You know, they just didn't leave a note, but they, you know, or they ran their car into a Jeep into a tree. And, you know, if that guy hadn't survived, we, you know, we wouldn't know. Um, so um, those, those are just some of the pieces, but my, my feeling is that that would be, you know, a societal shift as we've, we've gone through the, the ages here, plus just better tracking and internet and, and data sharing, you know, 40s and 50s, it was, you know, obviously had no internet and no, you know, very fast way of communicating data back and forth. So, um, of course, things are faster and, and we can stay on top of things a lot better now than we could back then. But I don't know if you guys have other insight. I I have a question. Um, working at Kent County Veteran Services, um, everyone calls and says, I have, my veteran is, wants to commit suicide, or I, we'll get those calls. Um, and, or they'll, they'll go and they'll engage the VA. I think what's really important is that this is a, a community problem, and they come in from all facets, and utilizing the VA, which is good, but it's not, always the answer, because um, many times um, it's difficult to get them into the program. And so Derek, if you could just kind of touch a little bit about the VA and maybe the program for those veterans that are struggling when it's that emergency type. Yeah, it's, it's some of the similar problems um, alluded to in his presentation. Um, bed availability is brutal. Uh, we have been flooring uh, with diversion, which means we have bed capacity and we don't have bed capacity. We've been flirting with being on and off diversion almost every hour the past two weeks. And because of how we are structured, we belong with Ohio and Indiana. We have to send veterans to those places. We don't um, have capacity. The role that I was in prior to this one, I worked up in the rural areas, Oceana County, Mason County, Lake, Macosta, and Nuevo and it was brutal to try to coordinate with the VA. I'm gonna be honest with you, most of the time if they had adequate transportation, and you probably don't wanna hear this, I say get your butts in the car and drive down to Battle Creek. Walk into urgent care and get assessed. Because part of this other piece is, if we send a veteran to an emergent care, somebody's gotta pay for it. And if it's not approved by the VA, that veteran's stuck with a quite expensive medical bill which they're not overly happy about because a lot of times they're not overly excited to go in for treatment. So it is a very complex issue both inside the VA and outside and we struggle with some of the same things um, that you all struggle with on the civilian side. Uh, we have open access which is newer. You can walk in and be seen today. That wasn't always the case. Um, something that just opened up this week is veterans can go online and schedule with their provider at any time, like through My Healthy Vet, that's something that's brand new. So we are trying to be proactive in ways in which we open access to care, um, but it's still, it's a complex issue and it's still quite a struggle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Any other questions? I can add, I wanna add something to that as well. Um, I, I worked with the Battle Creek system as well quite a, quite a bit, and a lot of times in the severely mental uh, ill people, when they come into um, an ER facility, and there are no beds. You guys are on diversion. Um, I've been working with the utilization management team at the VA. A lot of times they will authorize payment if the veteran is qualified to go into a, a civilian um, inpatient facilities. So. so the VA is doing a good job partnering with the community to try and make sure that these veterans are getting qualified or getting, uh, getting the services that they, they deserve. So. What is the best way for the people in the audience and myself to try to um, kick somebody in the butt <laughs> to, to open up more beds um, for our veterans? I mean, should we write our Congress people or should we write the VA or what's... From, from what I've been hearing and, and, and the information that I've gotten, it's not even the beds as much as it is the psychiatrists and the, the providers that are available within the VA as well as without. There's a shortage everywhere 
you know, I know in Michigan there's a big issue. Um, and, and so that, like when I was talking to, uh, I want to say Matt Newman, um, when he was in his old position, he said they have 33 beds available for inpatient care. They have the capability to do 55 beds, but they only have the providers to do 33. So, so you need more psychiatrists. Will ner nurse practitioners be able to move into some of those positions, we do you think? We have psych psychiatric nurse practitioners for sure. Um, but even then, it's there's very few primary programs where you can get it. So it's a post-master's or post-doctoral uh, recertification that they go back to uh, if they're not working out of their scope. But yeah. um, yeah. even then, I mean, nurse practitioners are rapidly advancing their, their numbers. Um, but we've had an open position for a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Iron Mountain since I've been there that's unfilled. And well, our psychiatrist uh, that works for North Point, speaking of the shortage, uh, he comes down from Marquette and he only comes down two days a week. So he's down with us two days a week and then he's up three days a week in Marquette. So, Joseph? And I was gonna say, um, in Illinois, of course we now have prescribing psychologists. We have APNs in mental health and psychiatry. And that's great, but hospital uh, uh, privileging is still locked into the physician can be the only one admitting. So if you got a psych unit, it has to be the psychiatrist doing the admitting. So until they start expanding those privileges, um, we're going to be kind of bottlenecked right there uh, at the psychiatric hospital side. And it's kind of interesting because what we're hearing also is paralleling uh, the availability of psychiatrists uh, psychiatric beds, uh, and the wait in the emergency rooms uh, for non-veterans. That's true. I wanted to add something uh, to that. I think we're talking, uh, what, the, what we're talking about here is uh, intervention uh, during critical situations or in crisis mode. Uh, one of the things I think all of us should be thinking about over the long term is what is leading uh, people into the uh, state of mind where uh, the, the critical situations are emerging and if, uh, there's a lot of uh, what uh, what Jeff uh, had uh, has shared with us today about the interpersonal theory about why do we have people that are perceived perceiving themselves as being burdensome to society and why are people losing their uh, their social connections to the degree that they feel isolated and those are things that we can all do quite a lot about on a day-to-day -day basis on a one-to-one -one basis and I don't want to lose sight of it and that moves right into my my next question is that can we do one more question um, what are the most effective programs for veterans depression and PTS I mean how do we stop this before it gets to be at the suicide level Some, some of the programs that are out there, buddy to buddy, uh, any of the peer support programs um, can help. Uh, I just, I've seen it uh, in Muskegon, so I worked at the VA in Muskegon here, and uh, Chris Graff's a great peer support personnel, teaches veterans how to deal with and cope with some of the, the, uh, the issues. You know, uh, creating resiliency is a big issue. Um, I know in Muskegon County, coming up on the 31st, there's a resiliency conference that's literally focusing on creating resiliency within veterans and the community. Um, we'll so that. it's a pretty neat little thing coming up. And there's a number of programs. Uh, I was just reading, uh, I talked a little bit about Dr. Bryan from U the University of Utah. He runs a PTS, uh, it's kind of like a getaway um, that he mentors uh, groups of veterans when they go on this. And I think, according to his research, it was like an 80% success rate of uh, veterans who were that uh, really is good. reported a severe, uh, a significant decrease in symptomatic uh, symptoms of their PTS. And, and there have been a couple references in people's presentations, but do you think more of a experiential, longer term, you know, like, programs work with veterans helping veterans? I mean, I, you know, like, um, I know there are ranches and trips that can be taken with veterans, with veterans, helping each other and working together, again, to develop that sense of community and connection. 
it sounds like the panel would really lean towards those kinds of programs. I would also add at the operational level, that is, uh, troops being deployed need to be pre better prepared. Um, things like psychological first aid, resiliency training, um, measuring that in the individual pre-deployment. Post-deployment, uh, spending more time with the re-entry. It's easier to do, of course, uh, with active duty forces. It's a lot tougher to do with Reserve and National Guard, especially since we're getting a lot of uh, individual mobilization. So, you know, two or three people from this unit will be sent in three different directions, and, and that much is done. Um, so that, that we're talking about almost providing a prophylactic to, to some extent at that level. Yeah, and I, can't, I can't speak for Colonel Kaiser, but I'm sure he would say uh, spirituality would be a, yes. Yes. a key component as well. Just a quick question, could you guys speak to the efficacy of EMDR and how that could play a role more so than what, I, what you see it in right now? Um, just because you see some of the uh, case studies and you see some of the successes with the operations groups that they were doing it on. And I'm just wondering, can you guys speak to that a little bit? The EMDR. Can you, what, what's the, the, the treatment? Eye, the eye movement. Eye movement. Oh, the eye, eye movement. movement. Okay, yeah, yeah. rapid eye movement. Yeah, just a, a thought on EMDR. Uh, again, there are a lot of different potential psychotherapies out there. Uh, one is as good as the other. Uh, the question is how willing are people to, uh, to follow, follow the direction of it and engage with the therapist? And is the therapist capable of sustaining communication? And so a lot of veterans are reporting good results with the MDR is it, it's a somatic integration basically you you're integrating something in your body mm -hmm. uh, focusing your attention I would say mind, mindfulness meditation would be just as good but mm -hmm. if you can can focus your attention uh, which that would help you to do and then combine that with uh, some uh, sense making process uh, a process that could be extremely effective so I think it, it'll continue to grow it seems to be already it looks like we have one more question at the back so my organization gets a lot of calls from parents, spouses, mm -hmm. uh, neighbors, roommates. The vet their veteran is showing signs and symptoms of suicidality. Uh, you know, just they're not they're not the person that they used to be. They want they call us and they want to know what's the best way that I can convince them to go in and seek treatment. You know, I've tried. They they're not interested but this person is still trying to seek help for them. What, what advice should we be giving them to make sure that they're, they're pushing the veteran towards treatment in a helpful manner? One, uh, just one thought on that is to expand the idea of what treatment is. And I think it kind of follows on to what this gentleman was saying is that everybody's different, everybody has a different thing they'll respond to. So suggesting that someone needs to go into a specific kind of therapy and if they're resistant to that, uh, you're probably frustrating them more than finding something that they feel will work for them, uh, that they'll stick with, and that they'll engage, they'll engage in. So it's, it's helping people find that. And again, I, I kind of have to conclude again with George, uh, that George Valiant chart, when you look at education as being the most influential thing along the life span if we can stay engaged keep fo keep uh, goals in our focus and keep learning throughout our lives all of us uh, not just veterans uh, will be healthier and that includes mental health then that also uh, might necessitate uh, the talking about what are the barriers uh, that individual might have some perceived barriers uh, regarding treatment well i don't want to go and get all drugged up I had a relative tell me that and i found out in the, to some extent, it was true. She got back from Iraq, uh, set up an appointment at a VA uh, in uh, uh, Virginia, uh, drove uh, two and a half, three hours there, and uh, they gave her a bunch of scripts and said, uh, we'll see you in about uh, eight weeks. And uh, fortunately, uh, she sought out a private psychologist uh, for therapy. So there might be perceived barriers that individual has like you know like I mentioned I don't want to get drugged up one of the things that I do when I talk with a veteran who's seeking help you know a lot of times it's not one issue it's six issues mm -hmm. yeah. 
is, you know, I, I, like if, say if Jeff was the veteran, hey Jeff, what's that number one thing that, would, that I could help alleviate that stress from? Mm -hmm. They tell me that, then I work on that one. And then I, once I get done with that one, then I can try and help them work on that next one. And, and, and snowball effect that through, you know, maybe you can get them into that treatment down the road. And probably the biggest suggestion that, that I could give you when you have that kind of barrier system there is if they have the ability to engage with another veteran that's close to that person and have that veteran engage with that person. A lot of times, if it's non-veterans coming at a veteran, uh, they're, they're not going to listen. And you probably heard it three or four times, if not a hundred times today. A veteran talking to a veteran is completely different than a non-veteran trying to convince a veteran of something. As soon as the veteran knows that I can relate or you can relate, uh, it's a completely different conversation. It may not solve the problem, but your chances of success are probably much higher than a non-veteran engagement than a veteran-to-veteran -veteran or a buddy-to-buddy -buddy type engagement. I've also seen um, a little success in like Alana's case or uh, your case there where you come from that military family. So if you, you gotta lead with that. Like my dad was a vet, a combat vet. My mom's in, or my husband was in. They'll, they'll, it'll break down a little bit of that, um, you know, pushback, so. Plus you have to have talent talking with people. You have to let them feel comfortable. And then it usually <laughs> takes about five minutes before I can get the whole story. So um, yeah, it's the talent of talking. Any other, one more? All right. I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up all everybody's time on these questions, but coming back to what you were saying up there, as far as the veteran, if, if they're noticing that, I wish my family would have noticed a little bit more, but if they're re resentful in what you're, you're trying to get them to do, think back to what their positives were in their life. Mine happened to be hunting, fishing, camping, any type of activity outside. Get them off of that thought. Get them back to something. Take them back to the basic. And if that and that eventually will bring them around. That helped me a lot after what I did and I came back home and my family finally realized what my problem was. They got me more involved with the things that I did. You know, because that, that was a uh, stress relief. And I, I think you're bringing up something that's very important. There's no one prescribed route to recovery. And it, it might be some of the things that you've engaged in. Uh, for others, it might be um, getting into artwork. For others, it might be sitting down and writing their story. Uh, it's not so much what is the correct way, but as much as what is working for that person. Mm -hmm. And that worked for you. That's a great way to end this conference, and I really appreciate all our presenters. Thank you so much for speaking to our, our group. We're very thankful. Thank you for coming. Um, just a few, a few words. If you have not filled out the questionnaire, please do um, put it on. That just gives us more guidance as for next year's conference. Thank you all, and travel safe.